So we're in notes number 11. And on the page uh, 249, as it says at the upper right corner, from the old 757 sequence. And that's the uh, PDF page number 6 out of 11 in this note set. And what I've been able to do is set up the, uh, the problem um, where the delays uh, are a column vector t, and they're generated in a forward modeling way by multiplying the um, uh, information or model covariance matrix, which uh, um, actually, uh, let's just call it the L matrix, which has the lengths of each ray in each block, and thus is mostly 0 for most of the seismological problems that we have. So that uh, ray length matrix L gets multiplied by the column vector, which is the slowness matrix, or slowness uh, vector. That's the model space, which for every block number, you know, however the, the blocks are numbered, whatever topology they actually have, um, every block has a number, uh, whatever shape they are. And uh, each block number has a slowness value. I'm sorry, a slowness perturbation value. So you multiply the slowness perturbation by the ray length. Um, and you add all those up over all the different blocks, uh, including those uh, for which the ray length is 0. And you get the total delay, uh, the total travel time delay in the data. So we know how to uh, form a classic least square solution. And we see that uh, even a relatively classic problem is uh, somewhat difficult to solve because of the size of this uh, L transpose L matrix in the normal equations. This is the normal equation right here. So what we assume is that uh, if we take L transpose L, and that's uh, what's classically called the information matrix or the model covariance matrix, L transpose L tells us that for this ray set, of course, L transpose L is specific. Uh, you know, it's not exactly the model space. It's the it's the uh, interaction of the model space with the ray set, being the the number of uh, number or the lengths of uh, all the rays in uh, in in all the blocks. So L transpose L basically relates. You know all of the um, the ray relationships between the different blocks, and if you're on the diagonal of L transpose L, what you're looking at is the sum of the squares of all of the ray lengths in that block, the lengths of e of all the rays in that block. Okay, so uh, hopefully you don't have along the diagonal you don't have very many. That are uh, zero. In other words, there's a block with no rays at all through it. Certainly happens in our tomography problems, or especially our refraction tomography problems. And we can, uh, you know, easily think about how to partition L transpose L uh, and just pay no attention to those blocks that are definitely in the null space of the model here, given our ray set. Again, L transpose L is entirely dependent on the geometry of the of the data, the the ray set. Okay, so it's really uh, it's really a very uh, problem specific um, item. Much more problem specific than the uh, uh, than the model column vector itself. So we have uh, partitioned off the uh, you know most of the. The diagonal elements of L transpose L, the ones that are um, that are that are non-zero, uh, and uh, so we can process the uh, uh, under the tomographic approximation. We say, all right, those diagonal values of L transpose L, those are the only ones that matter. We're going to ignore 
the contributions of all of the non-zero off-diagonal elements of L transpose L. Uh, and those are only you know, where a ray um, goes through two blocks. Those are the uh, 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 those are the place those are the the entries in uh, off the diagonal of L transpose L that'll have non-zero value. So those are also relatively sparse. Most of the off diagonal elements of L transpose L are zero. So we're going to assume they're all zero. Okay, uh, it's kind of a brutal assumption, of course, but um, look at the simplification that it leads to. All right. Basically, we can say that um, all the work of our, of our inversion under this tomographic approximation is really done by uh, essentially a dot product of, of the diagonal of, um, of L, um, of the, uh, the dot product of the diagonal vector of, of L, uh, I'm sorry, L transpose L. Okay. Um, no. It's uh, it's done by the transpose of the L matrix, which is what this is. Okay. And it's dot product with the dot with the column vector that is our times. So basically, this this is is saying, all right, we're going to um, we're going to just take the transpose of the L matrix that we use for modeling, and instead of using its inverse, which we can't get anyway since it's not, you know, under linear algebra, since it's not uh, square, um, instead of finding an inverse for that, um, we're simply going to transpose it and process it. We're going to multiply these. Um, we're going to multiply these ray lengths, you know, which are in meters times time. So we get. You know what we're going to have is meters times time. That's not slowness, right? That's uh, uh, that's something else. Okay. Um, but then we're going to regard that as as most of the solution because look, the inverse of um, of the diagonal elements of L transpose L, which is simple to compute. You know, as long as you uh, just throw out those zero values along the diagonal. Okay. Um, it's just some scaling, right? The real work is done here. Here's a, a summation equation for the um, uh, the slowness estimated slowness of block B. I should really put a hat over this S because this is not the original <coughs> value. It's an it's a new estimate under the tomographic approximation. The real work is done here with this, you know, physically untenable. Idea of taking the meters and multiplying them by the seconds, okay, and then adding all that up. Yet that that really forms the whole character of the structure that we're going to go, we're going to get out of the, in fact, out of the whole inversion. Okay, this little summation here is really uh, most of the work, and as you look through uh, papers and and. Uh, uh, other lectures and books on on tomography and velocity inversion, at least, um, and investigate um, the as we will the extension of tomography to migration, okay, and uh, the inverse to the wave equation. You'll find, uh, and this is one of Clairbaut's assertions in Processing versus Inversion, his PVI book. You'll find that that this is really where all the action is, and and what's this dividing by? You know the sum of L squared. In other words, the sum of all the uh, uh, of all the ray links in that block. It's just a little bit of normalization. Well, it's just the inverse part, isn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, unit wise, it's got to be there, right? Because that's what what gives you um, seconds per meter. It's got to be there, but that's not where the action is. Okay. And, and notice what happens here. If, uh, if a block is poorly sampled and has a very small total ray length, then, then that really improperly blows up the, uh, the solution here. Okay, So the normalization doesn't even work in most of our underdetermined problems.
Now we'll we'll talk about all this. All right. Um, you know the the blocks uh, uh, with this equation, the blocks that are the best sampled are going to be the smallest part of this of the whole solution. Strangely enough. So this is very practical, and it turns out to be you know simple and and kind of you know incorrect as it is. It turns out to be the heart of the of the solution, the heart of any inversion. So if you don't see a feature uh, in some way uh, after you've applied the tomographic approximation, in fact, if you don't see a feature after just doing the numerator summation here across your your map of all the blocks, say, then it's really not in your data, and you're not going to find it, no matter how how tricky you are in doing the um, in doing the normalization and doing the inversion. Okay. Now there are there are certain assumptions that we've done in deriving this um, tomographic inverse. Okay. This tomographically approximated inverse. Um, the first assumption was that our slowness perturbations s do not affect the ray paths. Okay. So um, you know, no matter what happens, you would think that once you got the new uh, the new slowness, you know, by taking this this um, these slowness perturbations and adding it to a background slowness. You know, you'd have to retrace all the rays. Well, that is in, in fact true, and we didn't do that. Okay, so we've already made the incredible simplification, uh, and this is called linearity of these particular problems. That the uh, uh, the ray paths are 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 not affected, which means we can only get small, uh, really small perturbations. Uh, and if you think back to where you've seen tomography used, um, you might realize that that the uh, mantle, um, you know, the the mantle velocity heterogeneities of one percent, three percent at most uh, in the in the deep mantle, and, and also um, it's really not much more in the uh, in the upper mantle. Um, those small percentage uh, slowness perturbations um, are what you would expect from convection in the mantle. And that's why mantle tomography has been so successful, because it meets the assumptions. On the other hand, it took Satish and a non-tomographic uh, um, set of assumptions and, and allowing slowness perturbations uh, to fundamentally affect, to completely affect the ray paths, that's what allows uh, um, Satish's shallow methods to work. Okay. All right. So there's what I call the tomographic ap approximation that the uh, the off diagonal elements are zero, and then there's the linear the linearity assumption of the model that the slowness perturbations don't affect the ray paths. So working on the linearity, okay, let's quantify that a little bit by writing a general uh, ray trace forward problem, and this is this is using the radon transform, okay. Um, so you can see it's a it's a line integral along a uh, a path, right? Uh, it's um, it's along some ray geometry, okay, um, and so. Uh, for a certain source, a certain receiver location, you know, and these could be two D or three D or what have you, um, and a certain uh, uh, total slowness model, right, uh, which is the inverse of the total velocity. Okay, you can trace a ray path, and so uh, given that ray path, um, you have a slowness at every point along the ray. Okay, and then you integrate over the over the slowness along the ray, and that gives you the total travel time. Okay, uh, and that travel time is between the source and the receiver. So um, uh, that equation is nonlinear because the uh, the ray path 
depends on the total slowness. So let's linearize it. So instead of just talking about the total slowness, we'll say there's a background slowness S0 plus delta S, a slowness perturbation. And delta S is much, much less than S0. Okay? And you're going to ask, of course, you know, how, much, how much is much less? How much less is much less? And I guess my hint is that uh, um, when it's, 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 not, it's not a thousandth, it's not 0.01% or anything like that, um, I would say this, you know, this linearization has worked really well for mantle tomography. And they're you know, maybe up to 5%, it kind of works. All right, so you know we're not we're not dealing with a mathematically you know not what it what with what an engineer would accept as uh, two less thans there, um, you know, but under uh, well under ten percent. Okay. So for the mantle stuff, you basically just pick ahead of time where the ray is going to go. Yeah, you trace the ray uh, uh, through a uh, um, a radially. Uh, a radially symmetric model, or not not exactly radially. It's uh, it's ellipse it's ellipsoidal, but uh, yeah, there's the there's a background. Okay, so you trace it through the S zero, the background model, which is the radially symmetric uh, model, basically. But you could you could vary velocity in your starting model to get the geometry closer, right? Yeah, but that's uh, you know, you don't have to do that because okay. then you'd have to vary it and retrace the rays at every single uh, iteration. We'll talk about that. I mean, it's definitely a strategy. No, I was just saying, just choose a better geometry to start, not change it. Yeah. Um, just choose a better guess. Though. That adds uh, too much bias. I think that's been explored. Okay. Um, you're you're unless you're really sure, you're better off. Um, you're better off uh, starting with with a uh, a known model. Okay. Likewise, the travel time t, the total travel time is a is a background a a um, an expected time plus a delay. Okay, and the delay is much much less than the expected time. You know, do say to the radial model. Again. You know, ten uh, percent is probably too much, but but three percent is not too much, according to uh, you know my colleague's experience. All right, so we let um, the background time for a particular bit ray be the the uh, radon integral uh, through that ray of the background slowness. Okay. The background model slowness, you know, uh, for a, a long array which depends on the background slowness. Okay. So now we substitute that in. We substitute all that in, and we we have, you know, instead of t, we have t zero plus delta t is equal to the um, um, the integral uh, along the ray through the background slowness. Okay. Which depends on, um, uh, and the ray depends on the background slowness uh, plus the uh, the delta slowness plus the integral of uh, along the same ray. Um, yes, it's the same ray traced uh, through um, uh, the total slowness. Okay, uh, but uh, multiplied by you know every every dr multiplied by delta s by the slowness perturbation. Okay, so now obviously we can break that up into four different uh, um, terms. So we have the uh, uh, we have the the ray traced through the background slowness model. Multiplied by the uh, background slowness, dr times the background slowness. Okay, so that is of course equal to t zero by our definition there. And then um, we have the um, the 
derivative of the background slowness with respect to the ray times the derivative. Uh, and these, you know, these are going to be uh, functions that are too complicated to put here, but I, I, I hope you get the idea. The derivative of the ray is depends on the total slowness times the delta slowness, okay, uh, and then integral integrated along that uh, that uh, differential ray, okay, and the um, the the there's no derivative of the background slowness with respect to the ray because of Fermat's principle. The ray is stationary. All right. Um, so we're going to we're going to assume that uh, this term is zero. The third term is the integral along a ray traced through the background slowness model, okay, where the dr is multiplied by delta s, okay, and then the um, um, the uh, fourth term is the derivative of delta s with respect to the ray, which since delta s is what we're going to invert for, that's certainly not zero, okay. But then the uh, um, the derivative of the of the ray with respect to the total s times delta s, okay. But uh, notice here we've got two delta s's multiplied by each other. So you know under our assumption. That uh, delta s is much much smaller than s naught. Okay. Under that assumption, then we say, all right, we'll take we'll take delta s squared as as too small to worry about. And so we're going to call this fourth term zero too. But of course, this is you know this is the term where you get in trouble. Okay. Um, you know, if if delta s really isn't small enough, and the ray really depends on it, then of course, this is going to be a problem. All right. So, um, uh, but that's the assumption we'll make for now. And so, you know, we have t zero, and that's underlined in blue, right? So, uh, we take out t zero, we subtract t zero from the left hand side, and t zero on the right hand side is over here. So we're tr subtracting t zero from the right hand side, and um, the third and the second and fourth term we've called zero. So all that's left is that uh, delta t, the delay, is a radon integral, you know, using rays determined by the background slowness multiplied by the slowness perturbation. Okay, and that's what we want. Okay, there it is. So now we have a linear relation between um, between delta t and delta s. Okay, right? Because this is a, this integral is just a bunch of sum. You know, we're just summing up a bunch of delta s's in a bunch of different uh, um, different blocks along the ray. Uh, but the convenience here is that we're determining delta t, and we're assuming, you know, via this logic, that it has no effect on our rays, because the ray traced here depends only on s naught, on the background slowness model. Oh, sorry, call it the reference model. I don't know why I keep calling it background. Okay, so here's. Uh, uh, a real, um, a real nice, uh, uh, quick little example, um, which directly uses the the slant stack and the radon transform. So let's uh, let's allow the background slowness to be constant, which means we're assuming straight rays. Okay, and we can do convenient things like the slant stack. Here's the uh, the earthquake tomography geometry, uh, kind of the mantle tomography geometry. All right. So um, down to some depth, we assume that that all of the delays that we that we measure at each receiver, and in in a two D world here, we're at uh, x sub r and zero depth. 
Okay. Uh, and all the delays that we measure at those receivers are due to slowness perturbations down to some depth capital D. And we have a um, uh, uh, rays coming up to each receiver that are at um, at uh, uh, you know what what gives the geometry of each ray is the location of the receiver x sub r and the uh, ray angle theta. Um, and the rays are straight because the background is constant. Um, now, of course, uh, you know for real mantle tomography, this has to be elaborated onto a um, uh, a spherical Earth, you know, where there's a latitude and longitude of each receiver, and uh, the angles, um, um, you know, the angles depend on the location of the earthquake through a background model, which you know has a lot of changes uh, down uh, down in the lower mantle and the core, of course, um, and you also have to do something to take out the crust. Um, so uh, uh, there's a few more complications, but not many. All right. So here's the simplest possible forward problem. Okay. Uh, delta t as a function of x and theta is equal to uh, the integral between over z. Okay. Between zero and 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 d. Right. Instead of using we're we're going to integrate over z instead of uh, d. So uh, instead of r. I'm sorry. Uh, so to get dz from dr, we have to divide by cosine theta. Okay. So um, we're um, we're going to integrate through all the uh, delta s's along a ray, which is traced via uh, x equal to xr x sub r minus uh, z times tangent theta, uh, and uh, at the at z. Okay. Um, and um, and so now uh, we can we can very uh, make some simplifications. Um, let's define uh, um, delta x delta t prime, which is uh, going to be in terms instead of theta um, x and the slow the slowness the ray parameter p, right? Which is just going to be uh, delta t times uh, cosine theta. Okay. So it's delta t in terms of x and theta, and you multiply it by cosine theta, and you've got delta t prime. Okay, and then uh, p is tangent theta. All right, and then um, uh, delta t. Now we can define delta t prime uh, of uh, p and x is this integral with z uh, through uh, uh, delta s. Uh, at uh, x equals x sub r minus z times p, uh, and at z, dz. All right. So um, let's assume that uh, uh, you know for uh, z not a member of this uh, area zero through d. In other words, you know there's no slowness perturbations uh, outside. Okay, or or deeper. Than the that the depth interval we're looking at, then um, you know what we've got here is a very simple radon transform, and in fact is precisely a slant stack, right? You know this is essentially uh, you know tau my uh, uh, t minus p x, right? Um, so to invert for uh, delta s, all we have to do is apply the inverse radon transform to the um, the delta t prime data. And there's uh, there's the inverse radon transform. There's the convolution with the row filter. Now we see it's a row filter in Z. So you know we're um, we're having to um, remove um, you know remove anything that uh, is uh, low frequency in Z, as it were, low spatial frequency. And we're just uh, slant stacking through. You know, we got to convert our data to. Uh, we're actually converting the times, right? We're scaling the times by cosine theta, okay, to get the delta t prime data set. But then we just slant stack it. So uh, to model, you begin with uh, delta s, 
um, as a function of x and z, and you slant stack, and you get uh, as a function of x sub r and theta, okay, angle. So I might call that a radon. Uh, you know, if I'm if I'm slant stacking versus angle theta instead of uh, p slowness, I might call that um, a radon a radon stack. Okay, uh, so this is a, a, a theta axis. So we get uh, uh, synthetic delays delta t, which are in terms of uh, x sub r and theta. We weight by cosine theta, and we have delta t prime. Okay, on an x p axis, just like we've seen before. Then uh, to invert, we begin with our our scaled times. You know, scaled by the cosine of uh, of theta. Uh, over our xp axis, we inverse slant stack to an xz axis, okay, and we've got our delta s as a function of x and z. So you know, we boiled down the whole tomography problem, the whole velocity inversion problem, to an inverse slant stack, and it you know, of course, it fits the uh, uh, the tomographic approximation very well, and it's uh, it's linearized. Okay. Now uh, Clairbout suggests that uh, if we have a flat reflector, uh, you know, we don't have to call it just an earthquake problem. We can, for a flat reflector, we can call it a reflection tomography as well. And we do that by um, by reflecting our ray uh, around the uh, around the, the reflection point. Of course, this is constant velocity, and if we have a flat reflector, it's very easy to do that. And so, um, you know, from the surface, we go not just to d, but to two times d, where we have an image, where we have an a uh, um, an image source. Okay, and uh, we still are, you know, our ray still has a. It's appearing at this x sub r. And it's appearing with an angle theta, about 45 degrees in this picture. Um, you could call the x sub r a midpoint, um, or you could just call instead of x, you call it a midpoint. And uh, of course, um, this brings a, a little bit of uh, control to this because um, what you'd like is to see in this geometry, you'd like to see uh, those things that are that are mirrored around this depth d. And if it's not symmetrical around d, then uh, you would say, all right, that's, uh, you know, that can't be real. That's not going to be part of, my, uh, uh, part of my result. So uh, very simple uh, suggestion. Okay. Here's a, an example that, uh, that Clayton uh, uh, cooked up. And uh, here's uh, um, a uh, common midpoint gather. And you can see lots of reflections in it. And then there's a very prominent reflection uh, that builds an amplitude uh, with even uh, medium offsets. You know, this is uh, definitely a pre-critical reflection here. Very large amplitude. And if you, uh, if you just take this part, correct it for NMO, and plot it in an expanded way, you can see that, that in addition to the, uh, the large amplitude, there's a little bit of, um, there's a little bit of, uh, of timing uh, uh, difference. You know, you, uh, you got a pretty good velocity here, but uh, in, um, in some areas, uh, uh, there's a little bit of delta t as well. All right? Now, the, the delta t is all the data we're using in this problem. Okay, which you can see, there's a lot more in this section than than just the the minor delta t, the minor delay in here. Of course, the, it's the association of those delays with um, uh, with the large reflection amplitudes, and in fact, the multi-cycle nature of the reflection too. Um, you know, that's what confirms that uh, 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 this is uh, this is a gas prospect. Okay, so here's uh, uh, here's that uh, flat reflector uh, 
uh, synthetic. All right, this this is an illustration of what data might look like. Okay, here's a um, here's a flat reflector uh, synthetic, and uh, this is the model space here. Okay, and you can see that uh, um, some uh, slowness perturbation has been added in here. It's got positive value, and it spells out gas. All right, so we do the the first slant stack, and this is um, you know basically uh, x um, uh, increasing to the right and h offset increasing down, and you can see that at certain positions, at certain offsets, your uh, which in of course certain offsets translate to certain angles, you know you're you're more or less likely to see. Um, uh, delays, so the darkness here correlates with the amount of delay, and then the inversion, just very very simple, okay, uh, very very simple slant stack, uh, inverse slant stack. In fact, here I don't think, don't think the row filter has been applied because there's not enough negative in this uh, in this inversion, although it's hard to tell with a wiggle trace. Um, you can see that that with this particular geometry, okay, uh, you know where where the anomaly follows rays, you know prominent rays, reflection rays, we're going to we're going to see the uh, we're definitely going to see the anomaly, okay, but um, uh, we're missing horizontal rays, which means we're not sensitive. You know, we got nothing to collect, no horizontal rays to collect uh, a lot of um, um, a lot of uh, delay along the horizontal structure in these words, in these letters, right? So all the horizontal parts are missing. Um, so that's uh, you know basically the story there is told by L transpose L. Okay. If this survey was much much wider and had much much longer offsets, so that there were some horizontal rays, or new, more nearly horizontal rays, then um, it would be a different story. But with this kind of typical sort of um, you know reflection geometry, there aren't any rays anywhere near horizontal enough to recover those. Horizontal parts of the letters. All right. So let's go on to uh, number twelve. Um, and so uh, here, I'm going to talk a little bit about just what you were suggesting, which is. You know, what if we let the reference velocity vary and we retrace the rays? Okay. So, um, what if the background, the reference velocity, the reference slowness model S naught as a function of x and z? Notice it doesn't have to be constant at all. Okay. Right. Then. Uh, uh, you know, we're going to have instead of straight ray paths, we're going to have curved ray paths. Okay, so um, let's recall the forward calculation of delay times. So you've got delta t is equal to L applied to delta s. Delta t and delta s are column vectors. L is the matrix. Okay, um, each element of L. Is uh, a ray length of ray number r in block number b. Again, uh, we're not saying anything here about the actual topology or geometry of the different blocks, and 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 even less about how they're numbered. They're just numbered in some way that we can keep track of. Uh, typically, the model size n blocks is um, is smaller than the data size, the number of observations. Okay, uh, so the L matrix is uh, is fairly columnar. Uh, you know, when you when you multiply the uh, um, 
when you multiply the the matrix times a um, a column vector, you know basically you you um, take the transpose of the column vector, you lay it on top of of each row of the matrix, do a dot product, and that dot product appears at the corresponding um, level or or uh, uh, row of uh, the uh, um, the result uh, column vector. Uh, here's the uh, the normal equations. Okay, L transpose applied to delta T is equal to L transpose L applied to delta S. All right, we're going to let uh, R uh, stand in for the information matrix for L, tra L transpose L. Okay, so R is a square matrix, and uh, uh, I had kind of munged the uh, um, the uh, notation here. So you know each element of the of the R matrix. Uh, is at um, um, a uh, ray A and uh, yeah the, the sub R was a little confusing um, so it's ray A block B and uh, it's the uh, the sum for all uh, rays of um, um, no I'm sorry block uh, block A block B I'm sorry. And sum of all rays, so we're summing over k, okay, um, of L. Notice the first uh, index on L is the ray number. So it's L for ray k, uh, the length of ray k in block A, times the length of the same ray k in block B. Okay? And I think we worked out last time, yeah, that's actually what the. Uh, L matrix is, and um, and then along the diagonal, okay, R sub B B, right? We have the sum for all the rays K uh, of um, uh, the length squared in that block B. So um, R sub uh, let's call it a, uh, R sub A B. It's a measure of a probability of the probability that a ray in in cell A was also in cell B. Okay, sorry about the shifting notation here. Uh, now, any row, okay, R sub, um, and and we're going to take some, you know. Uh, so it's uh, you know A B C all the blocks. So K uh, takes uh, the value of all the blocks, but B. Okay, so a row is for all the blocks, but for block B on the second uh, index. Okay, any row of of the information matrix R is the basic back projection or Green's function of that particular block B. That's also called the block spread function. Uh, you know, this is a lot of math, and I think this will become clearer when I show you some examples, like uh, in uh, notes number 13 from um, Gene Humphreys' thesis. Um, you can do what's called a deconvolution, right? Now, now um, what would make tomography perfect? Okay, Each row is a spike. And, it, and there's a, uh, a value along at the diagonal, right, at R sub BB, OK, uh, and 0 everywhere else. So you could imagine, uh, you could imagine taking, uh, you know, so we've got this, uh, um, you know, let's, oh, let's call it K, OK, K, no. Make it the rows. All right. It's also what I say about the rows of the information matrix is, is also true about the columns. So that's K, block number K, and that's going to be block number B. And we're looking along a row of the information matrix for a particular value of B. And uh, you know, we're going to uh, 
we're going to see uh, some kind of uh, point spread function. Okay, and uh, we look along another row, say down here. Okay. Uh, well, this is the uh, the axis, right? So at a certain value of b, we're we're right there. It's the way I'm used to drawing it. Okay, different values of you know block k. So there's the diagonal of uh, of L transpose L, right? And we we want to see a spike at. Uh, um, What we would like to see is zero off-diagonal elements along that uh, that row of the information matrix, and um, um, and we'd like to see uh, um, Um, we'd like to see a spike on the diagonal and zero off the diagonal. Okay, so maybe there's some way that by looking at uh, at you know the information matrix, we can do what's called what we could call here deconvolution. All right, we could use the rows of the information matrix to uh, you know to do some kind of Deconvolution, which would make the off-diagonal off -diagonal element zero, and the uh, and the diagonal elements more like spikes. Okay, and that would make if we could do that, right? If if the off-diagonal elements we could get all set to zero, then um, then tomography would work, just like that. All right. Is transforming R deconvolution could be called transforming R into an identity matrix, or as uh, Gene Humphreys called it, deblurring. And you can also achieve deblurring and and a measure of deconvolution through uh, iteration. Okay, so that's that's this is kind of a, a review of where we're going. Okay, and we're going to be talking about this quite a lot. Um, so I'm sort of going to introduce it for this problem, and then uh, later on I should get a chance to come back and introduce it all over again for some very simple linear operators. All right. Here's the introduction for real tomography problems, basically from Gene Humphreys' thesis. So the Dampley squares inverse of uh, Here's the forward problem. You know the uh, delays are equal to the L matrix times the slownesses. Uh, it goes this way. All right. So the delta s, and we should put a hat over it. Um, it's a slowness. It's a slowness perturbation estimate. Okay, is equal to L transpose L plus um, some lambda, some scaled identity matrix. Okay, and you take the uh, the inverse of that whole thing, um, of that whole, and that's this is another way, of course, of of uh, dealing with the uh, um, the the zero elements along the diagonal of L transpose L. Okay, so that's this that inverse scales L transpose applied to delta t. Uh, lambda, of course, is an adjustable damping factor. You know, it's chosen to be just large enough. That um, that L transpose L plus uh, gamma i is not singular. Uh, if you choose it very large, okay, then um, you know. Let's say that the um, you make uh, gamma equal to the uh, the variance, the total variance of L transpose L. Okay, the correlation along these spikes. All right, um, that's an overdamp solution. Uh, but notice that's uh, that's still going to leave the, the the negative truth here, which is L transpose delta t. That's the tomographic result, 
And, and you know, no matter what we do for this, uh, um, for this, this uh, inverse here, it's just some scaling. So over, over damping it can still work. We'll talk about that more later. All right. So uh, here's here's what happens when you overdamp. If uh, lambda is much much greater than the magnitude of L transpose L, then uh, look at what you end up with. You just end up with, you know, one over gamma uh, applied to L transpose delta t. All right, and that uh, uh, amazingly enough, that's a very useful procedure. It's something you should always try. Now let's uh, let's try a singular value decomposition, okay? An SVT uh, SVD of L. All right. So we'll say, uh, uh, or am I really uh, SVDing L transpose L? Um, okay. Let's say L is equal to uh, U uh, times a square matrix uh, applied to a, a matrix U applied to a square uh, a square matrix. Uh, that has just the uh, uh, the diag just a diagonal uh, lambda times a uh, a matrix uh, V transpose, um, and U and V are the row and column eigenvectors, and um, uh, lambda is the diagonal matrix of the uh, of the eigenvalues. Okay, um, so. Uh, uh, and you have these conditions: u transpose u is equal to i, and v transpose v is equal to the to identity. So the least squares inverse with uh, uh, with SVD is uh, delta s is equal to uh, par the partitioned v uh, times the inverse of the partitioned lambda applied to the inverse of the partitioned u transpose applied to the data. Okay, that's a generalized inverse solution. All right, so we'll come back uh, 10 o'clock on Tuesday, and um, I'll show you what happens in a very simple model where you can come up with the, um, the, 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 the singular values and the, uh, the eigenvalues uh, and eigenvectors uh, basically on a piece of paper.